So welcome to another special interview with Orinoco Tribune. And this time we have as guest, Palestinian author and activist, Khaled Barakat. So, and we'll be talking about, of course, Palestine and whatever is happening there. On October 7, the Palestinian resistance initiated an incredible military operation named Al-Aqsa Flood against the Zionist state. The Hamas-led operation unfolded with a dramatic dawn raid against the occupation military bases surrounding the Gaza Strip and the capturing of hundreds of prisoners. From the start, the commander of uh, the Al-Qasim Brigades, the military wing of Hamas, Muhammad Al-Daif, announced the goals of the operation included halting the ongoing Zionist desecration of the Al-Aqsa Mosque, the liberation of Palestinian prisoners, ending the siege of Gaza, and the end of uh, so-called security coordination in the West Bank between Israel and Palest the Palestinian Authority. In response to the immense defeat on October 7th, the Zionist entity has unleashed a real genocide against Palestinians in Gaza and the West Bank, killing over 10,000 uh, Palestinians and injuring more than 25,000, almost 75% of the dead and the wounded being children and women. The occupation warplanes have bombarded schools, hospitals, churches, and mosques, flattened entire residential areas in Gaza City, as well as in other urban centers of the Gaza Strip, and announced an ethnic cleansing plot to render Gaza uninhabitable and displace the entire population as a final solution to the Palestinian question. The Western powers led by the United States, as usual, have unleashed a global disinformation and psychological warfare campaign to justify the horrific crimes of the occupation. They have also ratcheted up repression in their own countries against all forms of support for the Palestinian struggle. The Al-Aqsa flood operation revealed that the occupation is weaker than a spider's web, which prompted the United States to deploy over 70 warships, including two nuclear powered aircraft carriers to the Mediterranean Sea to support its military outpost, which is a Zionist state. And according to the leaders of the resistance, the United States is now fully in control of the Israeli military and political decision-making. While constantly threatening Iran and Hezbollah not to enter the conflict, the US has delivered hundreds of plane loads of bombs and weapons to the Zionist entity and deployed thousands of its own marines, which according to Tasnim News are already on the ground in Gaza. In defense of Al-Aqsa and the Palestinian people, the forces of the Axis of Resistance in West Asia have begun to provide their own support with Ansarullah in Yemen, the popular mobilization units in Iraq, and Hezbollah in Lebanon, striking US and Israeli targets with missiles, drones, and rockets. And as the US-led Zionist incursions into Gaza continue to be repelled by the resistance forces, and the Zionists are unable to achieve strategic victories against the resistance forces, we can expect that the imperialists will continue to escalate their horrific crimes against humanity against the Palestinian civilians. And in spite of the massive international solidarity opposing the aggression against Gaza, it's clear that the US only understands the language of force. In this situation, Orinoco Tribune considers it essential to look at various aspects of the Palestinian cause and the Palestinian resistance, the current situation in Gaza, and why Palestine is important for anti-imperialists globally. In order to discuss these issues, we have with us Khaled Barakat, Palestinian writer and activist, currently based in Canada. Barakat, a leftist and revolutionary voice on Palestine, has been the target of numerous mere campaigns aimed at silencing as well as criminalizing him and others like him fighting for Palestinian rights in the diaspora. In 2019, he was deported from Germany because of his activism. In Canada also, he has been a target of threats and harassment coming from various quarters, including the Canadian parliament. And he is here with us uh, today to uh, talk about uh, various aspects of this issue. So thanks a lot, Khaled, for coming today, uh, I mean, accepting the invitation. Thank you very much for your invitation. Uh, it's an honor to be with you. Uh, it's an honor to have here, so it's mutual. Uh, so, like, since we are into it, let's just like directly start. And I'll start with the, I suppose, the most obvious question, that is the current war ongoing in Gaza 
is being described as a conflict between uh, Israel and Hamas. But how do you consider this narrative and the situation in Gaza? I think uh, people understand now that what is happening in Gaza is a total war uh, waged by Israel against the Palestinian people uh, in Gaza. And I think that uh, this is a, when they say this is a war between Israel and Hamas, this is a very classic and clear Zionist distortions of the real situation and mostly carried by U.S. and Western media, this so-called slogan of Israel Hamas war. The reason behind this is to say to us that Palestinians have no cause. Um, and uh, the conflict is with one organization. When we hear a Zionist say to us, uh, we have no problem with Palestinians, we are just fighting Hamas. We know they mean to tell us, you Palestinians, have no rights and have no cause. And so uh, this is almost uh, an attempt to ignore our existence, uh, the existence of the Palestinian people in one way or another. And, and to give the Zionist occupation forces uh, a US, uh, European, uh, so-called international community license to murder and kill as many uh, Palestinians as they wish. And when they target uh, now in Gaza, they say we targeted 300 uh, targets in Gaza. And, and the, Zionists, the, the Zionists have always used this, uh, you know, for example, from 1967 to 1973, under the very same slogan, they say that we have no problem with people in Gaza. Our issue is with the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine, the PFLP when the front was leading the armed struggle then in Gaza. They also used it to invade Lebanon and destroy the country, saying our problem is not is with the PLO, is not with the Palestinian refugees. I was saying that this is not limited to the Palestinian experience. I think, you know, the colonizers always use this line. Um, I think it is always used by all systems of oppressions and colonization. If you ask the people of, uh, you know, South Africa, India, Ireland, Algeria, they, you know, the native people here in Turtle Island, they have heard this from their uh, oppressors uh, uh, in one way or another. Yeah, using this slogan by the Zionists that the war is between, you know, Israel and Hamas uh, is actually a double-edged uh, sort uh, uh, of a weapon because uh, uh, it's actually counterproductive, and, and it's a failing strategy. No one believes it. It's a joke and a lie. And it's even more of a joke when just two months ago, they said, we have no problem with Hamas these days. We are just going to target Islamic Jihad, and we have a problem with, you know, and they assassinated the leaders of Islamic Jihad and their families as they were sleeping in their home. So... So this is, uh, you know, Palestinians don't take this seriously. However, there is a utilization of this slogan by the West in order to justify Israel, uh, you know, atrocities against the Palestinian people. Now, if Israel issue is with Hamas, and if the war is with Hamas, then why do we have 10,000 people killed uh, and over 3,000 under the rebels and mostly children? and women uh, who are not members of Hamas. Although we view Hamas as a um, part of our national liberation movement, and although we see also Hamas as spearheading the Palestinian resistance, and Hamas is leading the Palestinian resistance now in Gaza, but that is not the same as saying that the war is between Israel and Hamas. And if that's true also, why Israel is waging war against our people in the West Bank and Jerusalem and inside 1948 occupied land? If the war is against Hamas, then why are they targeting Palestinian nationalists and leftists? And there are over, you know, 10,000 Palestinian political prisoners that uh, mostly uh, over 50% of them are actually nationalists, but they're not Hamas.
Israel is waging a war against all Palestinians and um, all Palestinian political trends. But they're trying to strip the Palestinian people from their cause as a national liberation organization and kind of use that rhetoric of the U.S. that uh, the, the war on uh, Al-Qaeda or the war on ISIL or this and that. That's not working. They tried this in the beginning of this um, new wave of, of aggression. And now they don't even say it anymore. You know, Hamas is ISIS. They felt that it's failing strategy. And so they retreated. Okay, so yeah, thanks a lot because yeah, it's not really between Israel and Hamas, but uh, yeah, and they're not pretending that much anymore. It's, uh, it's interesting you say that they're changing. They have to change the narratives because it's not working anymore. That's uh, they're really at a loss. Um, and this leads into our our next question, which is that the Al Aqsa flood operation seems to be the natural flow and follow up after the sort of Al-Quds battle in 2021, um, which is part of this growing force of resistance in the region, uh, really over the past 17 years specifically, as, as I see it personally, which was when Hamas was, you know, was able to come into Gaza and uh, have the so retake sovereignty, as well as when Hezbollah defeated you know, the Zionist entity in the July war. So my, my question is, how do you see Al-Aqsa flood fitting into this post-Oslo era and lineage of Palestinian, Arab, and Islamic resistance uh, overall? And how would you, you trace that for people who, who don't really know the recent history? This is actually a very uh, important uh, and good question. Uh, I, I recently published a short study uh, in a square newspaper in Lebanon before October 7, um, and why the years 2005-2006 uh, is important to understand what is happening in the West Bank. And I, my study focused on the settlements and colonies in the West Bank. And they're related because 2005, 2006 uh, is the year that we entered kind of a, a new stage. It was the end of the Arafat era and the beginning of the uh, new Palestinians, well, not really new, but more of a reactionary uh, puppet uh, uh, Palestinian authority led by Mahmoud Abbas. And it was the end of the second Intifada. The second Intifada uh, had uh, uh, been crushed. Uh, and it was uh, a new era that they uh, called for elections of the Palestinian Authority in which Hamas participated in these elections and won. They won the elections and then immediately there was they waged a war against our people and, and against the resistance. Uh, and, uh, and Gaza was immediately uh, put under siege. And then we start hearing this list of conditions from the United States and from Europe. Uh, you have to recognize Israel as a Jewish state. You have to commit to Oslo agreements. You have to dissolve the uh, resistance uh, you know, uh, brigades and become a police force. Uh, you have to do this, you have to do that. It was a list of conditions, and they wanted not just Hamas to participate in elections, but they actually wanted Hamas to become uh, a security agency, just like the one uh, in the West Bank. Now, Western media, they intentionally try to mislead people about Hamas control of Gaza. They don't say Hamas won elections, and they don't say that uh, you know, uh, uh, Hamas was actually elected by the Palestinian people in the West Bank and Gaza. Overwhelmingly, you know, the vast, um, you know, a majority uh, uh, vote. Uh, they won't say that. They will use things like uh, Hamas controlled the Gaza uh, or Hamas did a coup. Uh, as a, an elected government is going to do a coup against itself, 
it's just it's just you know uh, all kind of garbage in in the Western media that they they're trying to put out for people uh, to mislead them. Now, in my view, the resistance did the right thing when they ended the Oslo team in Gaza and fully controlled, uh, 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 you know, uh, Gaza, because it meant that the resistance now had, I don't want to say a liberated land in, in, in Palestine. It was, it's not fully liberated, but it's semi-liberated. I have been in Gaza uh, after that, uh, and uh, you can actually go from Rafah all the way to Beit Hanun without, without any checkpoint. And if you try to do that in the West Bank, you know, from one village to another, you face an Israeli checkpoint. Also, the, the resistance in Gaza uh, celebrates uh, pluralism. Uh, you know, there are Palestinian nationalists, you know, Islamic groups, uh, you know, leftist, Marxist, Leninist, and there is a unified uh, front uh, for the resistance in, in Gaza. And that is a very important uh, fact uh, because, it, you know, it's, it's the liberals and uh, the, the, those who are U.S. allies that cannot understand pluralism and democratic, uh, you know, uh, not us, not the resistance. And at the same time, we also start seeing uh, a new um, kind of Gaza is depending on itself because siege actually makes people depend on themselves. You know, people need to understand when we talk about the steadfastness of Gaza, we're not just talking about the steadfastness of the armed resistance. We are talking about, you know, the fishers, the farmers, the workers, the teachers, the doctors, these are the popular classes that actually are carrying the, uh, uh, the tasks of the uh, sumud or uh, uh, steadfastness. And also, it gives the resistance a space to accumulate its strength, to build itself, to depend on itself, 90% of the arms is produced in Gaza. It's made in Gaza by our people and by the resistance. And this is very important because it's under siege. You cannot depend on any uh, source, including your very, uh, uh, you know, uh, supporters to provide uh, weapons for you. You have to depend on yourself. At the same time, the Palestinian resistance accumulated uh, and presented a new uh, way of uh, people's war or, uh, you know, uh, the armed struggle. Gaza doesn't have mountains. It's, as you know, it's an open air prison. It's very small. It, there's 2.1 million Palestinians living in less than 360 square kilometers. It's very densely and highly populated. So. How can the resistance actually carry its tasks in such uh, conditions? So the idea was to build another Gaza under Gaza. So these tunnels, networks of tunnels, they extended almost 360 miles under Gaza because that's the only way Palestinian resistance can actually uh, defend itself, store their arms, do their uh, programs, and uh, their training, and at the same time be able to fight uh, back. And I think that with every Israeli aggression from 2008, 2012, 2014, the Palestinian resistance would sit and evaluate how did they actually respond to the Israeli aggression? How can they improve their strength? And in 2019, they have uh, put something called the strategy to defend Gaza, which included in case of any scenario in the future that Israel would do something like a ground invasion or something like 
the attempts they tried to do in 2014, cutting Gaza into three areas and then trying to circle the uh, city of Gaza as they are doing now. Uh, so the resistance put all these scenarios and they developed a strategy and they did uh, three major uh, military training on this strategy. So every scenario that the Israeli commanders now are thinking to use, the Palestinian commanders know exactly how they can counter uh, that. And that's because the resistance have been um, developing um, tools and tactics for any uh, scenario. Now, the only thing, and that is the major thing really, that Israel is doing, and there's not much we can do about, and that is the bombardment from air. And that's why when they throw these, you know, thousands of tons of explosives on people's homes, on buildings, on universities, on hospitals, the resistance in Gaza does not have the weapons in which they can um, counter these Israeli uh, US, uh, you know, um, Air Force uh, strength. And, and I think after this uh, war uh, ends and uh, uh, the Palestinian resistance, first priority is going to be strengthening their, uh, their capabilities in order for them to um, counter these air force um, attacks. Now, there's another thing, uh, and I think it's important. Uh, when you look at the strength of the Palestinian resistance and what they did in the last uh, 17 years, it's almost like a miracle because they're under siege from all sides. They're being watched by all kinds of security agencies of Israel and Egyptian regime is not exactly a very friendly regime to the resistance. Um, and, you know, there is a lot of difficulties and challenges. And for the Palestinian resistance to manage a unified front in Gaza, and to be able to accumulate this knowledge and strength and to depend uh, on itself, this created also a very deep bond relationship between the armed resistance and the Palestinian people in Gaza. And that explains to you why the Palestinian people in Gaza would refuse to leave Gaza, because they feel that not just that they are they need to steadfast in their land and not to leave and to become refugee again and again because they know what it means through the experience of the last 75 years of displacements and disposition. But there's another thing also, and that our people is saying, we are going to be the shell of the Palestinian armed resistance, even if they kill all of us, because this is the only hope for Palestinians to keep their resistance strong and to keep that bond. And that's why we describe the relationship between the people and the resistance that happened in the last 17 years as the relationship between the blood and the flesh to the body. If you try to separate them, they'll bleed. If you try to separate the resistance from the people, they'll bleed. And so, in my view, that the Palestinian experience is a unique in so many ways in terms of a people capability of fighting a very strong, vicious, racist, colonialist regime with the minimum, very minimum uh, capabilities they have and be able to do what they, uh, what they did. Uh, and October 7th was kind of the uh, accumulation of all of this experience. And if you want, we can talk about October 7th uh, in itself, but as because it's not just a military operation, 
for us, October 7 is a, created a new stage for us and it carries a strategic, uh, very deep, uh, you know, strategic, um, offensive, uh, heroic act by the Palestinian resistance. Would you would you say more on on that component that you were just saying we could talk about the strategic consequences of Al Aqsa flood? Yes, as the Palestinian resistance surprised everybody, particularly the enemy, because the Israelis did not anticipate this uh, uh, offense. No one did. It's a it's a it's very surprise surprise attack, including most of Hamas. Uh, and the you know resistance movement itself it was it was kept in a very um, closed rooms with a, 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 you know because they wanted the operation to be successful and if you have heard the speech of the general secretary of Hezbollah Sayyid Hassan Nasrallah he said one of the elements of the successful of this operation that it was kept secret and in a very closed room, and otherwise it, it won't work. So this is one, the ability of the Palestinian resistance to have this strategic uh, kind of um, uh, tactical measures that convinced Israel that nothing will happen, and then all of a sudden, there was this very calculated, well-organized, uh, brave, comprehensive attack against Israel. Now, the resistance, in my view, was surprised to see how the Israeli uh, military uh, system was collapsing so easily. Uh, in fact, they only used 1,200 fighters in this offensive. Uh, and uh, against one of the most uh, well-equipped Israeli division called uh, Gaza Battalion. Uh, and Gaza Battalion is an Israeli, um, literally small army on the claves of Gaza that has uh, intelligence, military intelligence, um, elite units, um, all sorts of uh, weapons, um, you know, tanks, uh, um, military bases, you name it. They, you know, it's under this uh, unit called Gaza uh, Battalion. And they collapsed in hours. Um, and I think the Palestinian resistance was kind of surprised to see that. They thought that it might, it might take more than that. Uh, and it showed that this Israeli army is not exactly um, an army that is organized or uh, is um, willing to fight. Uh, we see that in the last uh, two weeks after the ground invasion, they stayed in their tanks, they're not willing to leave their tanks, and they get, you know, uh, attacked by the Palestinian resistance and they stay in their tanks. I mean, they're not fighters. They, they're, they're there, they throw them there without strategy and without any kind of specific tasks. And the very basic military rule is that if you send your soldiers to do any kind of task, the very first thing you do is you explain to them what is their task. They actually don't have a specific task. They're very confused. There is a mistrust between the ranks, uh, different ranks in the Israeli army. And there is a mistrust between the military leadership and the political leadership. So their actions is almost vengeance. It's, uh, it's just um, reckless and without any kind of calculations. And that makes... The Israeli army now more dangerous in terms of how much they can inflict destruction on the Palestinian people, but it also, on the other hand, makes them very weak in terms of 
the way uh, they are going to continue with this battle. The Palestinian resistance have already, in the last 48 hours, destroyed 30 of their tanks uh, with a very basic, uh, you know, Palestinian-made uh, rockets called the Yassin 105. It's uh, uh, and they're trapped in Gaza now. The other thing is important to, to see is that the resistance have calculated the Israeli reaction and what will uh, Israel uh, will do. But in terms of this destruction and war crimes and genocide that Israel is doing, this is the US doing. This is the US war. This is Germany, UK, France, and uh, others work. It's not just Israel. Israel is carrying these these uh, war crimes. Um, but when you look at the weapons used, when you look at the support they're getting, when you look at the political and media support, there is an entire imperialist camp standing behind uh, Israel. Right. There's um, there's a sentiment in that I've seen in a lot of the Arabic newspapers that, and you just repeated this, that Israel or the Zionist entity is really just like rabid or, or you know, they they don't have a, a strategy. They're just angry and, and mad about this. Whereas the American strategy is, is cold and calculated as, as Washington generally is regarding these. And there's questions about whether or not any of the Zionist entity has autonomy anymore at all in this process. So they're just, you know, being a, as I think that the Syed in his speech said that the, the idiot Israelis are now tools, uh, which, and, and what this means for this kind of ratcheting up aggression that we see, like, does, does the entity have an out? Like, is there, do they, does it have a way that it could, that it could even de-escalate without imploding, uh, if that makes sense. It, it, it makes sense. They are uh, weighing their options of how are they going to hold their defeat. They need to acknowledge that they are defeated. Now, if uh, this ends now, Netanyahu will fall tomorrow. You have to look at the situation in Israel and its internal crisis. What's guiding Netanyahu is his own personal uh, interest. It's not even the interest of Israel. It's not even the interest of the Israeli army. And, and you know, the very, very, very basic rule is that if you have a leader that uh, is leading an army and this person doesn't listen to anybody and this person is just doing whatever they they wanted to do because they want to save their uh, their own butt. Then uh, that, no matter how strong his army is, that leader is going to take his army into defeat. Uh, especially if the other uh, side uh, on the uh, 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 you know, even if it's a small army but organized, it will be able to defeat uh, you know that. Uh, strong army with a very bad uh, leader. And Netanyahu today have, I think, 76% today in the last poll of Israelis don't want him as the prime minister and they think that he should resign. Uh, and when a leader <laughs> is leading a war with like this kind of figures, then uh, he 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 is weak and he's defeated and his internal front is very weak and fragile. And so Israel is going to be defeated for sure uh, uh, in this uh, battle. The only thing they have is uh, they can kill more Palestinians. Yes, that they are doing and they're doing it around the clock and they're killing more Palestinian children, more destruction. Today, as you heard, some of the ministers were saying we should nuke Gaza and throw a, you know, a nuclear bomb on Gaza. I mean, that, that is like blatantly saying that Israel possesses nuclear weapons and willing to use it. 
uh, you know, publicly. I mean, just imagine if an Iranian minister would come and say, you know, when we have a nuclear bomb, even though Iran doesn't have one and don't want to have one, but to say, you know, we will use it, the West will not, you know, rest, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, if, if, if anyone actually says uh, such statement. But Israel, of course, are doing all of this with impunity. I think what I'm trying to say is that the Israelis are in crisis and this illusion that they created that it's the army that will never be defeated, it's been defeated. And they know that they were defeated in October 7th and they are being defeated on the ground. And they are being defeated morally because there's nothing brave about, you know, an Israeli pilot goes into his F-16 uh, you know, and throw bombs at children, but uh, there, there's 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 nothing to, to this. There's no victory in this. Uh, so, and we're talking about Gaza. Gaza was occupied in 1967 in less than five hours, and now they cannot even, you know, uh, they cannot even grab a one street in Gaza without getting. Uh, you know, uh, hit severely by the Palestinian uh, resistance. So the U.S., I think, is trying to tell Israel, try to think of a way to come out defeated, but not defeated uh, totally. Uh, and so they're trying to pressure the Palestinian resistance to give some concession. And as Tahili said in uh, her introduction that there was objectives of October 7. These objectives, we are going to achieve them, the release and the freedom of the Palestinian political prisoners. That is going to happen. And the end of siege on Gaza, that is going to also happen. And Israel is going to know that attacking Jerusalem and our Christians and Muslim sites, especially in Aqsa, will have consequences and repercussions. And these are just the immediate uh, objectives of the uh, operation. At the same time, linking the struggle of our people in Gaza with our people in the West Bank, Jerusalem, and 1948 land. And this is very important of what October 7th did. And another thing that is important is Palestinians in the diaspora are unified behind their resistance. All of these mobilization and demonstrations and refugee camps in Lebanon and Syria and Jordan and Europe and North America, the Palestinian, especially younger generation, are actually leading some of these uh, mobilization. And so the Palestinians in the diaspora, after 30 years, of being pushed into silence are reclaiming their cause and being part of this uh, battle. And these are strategic achievements that were uh, achieved by the October 7th uh, uh, heroic uh, offensive. So, yeah, thanks a lot for this very, I would say, very descriptive. Um, of descriptive uh, way of saying a lot of things into I think one could write a book about it but you shortened it quite a lot so yeah thanks for that and you said Israel is already defeated we understand that and in my opinion another side is also defeated and that is the Palestinian Authority in fact you have said this before also that the Palestinian Authority is actually Israel's line of defense against Palestinians themselves for decades, since at least since the Mahmoud Abbas times. And however, it is the Palestinian Authority that is the uh, legal representative of the Palestinian people in the inst international institutions, such as the United Nations. Now, what has Mahmoud Abbas and the Palestinian Authority doing since October 7, I mean, we haven't heard much about much from them. And also, how will this Al-Aqsa flood operation change the Palestinian internal politics in relation to the authority, as well as the PLO, let's say? 
This is a very important question because the Palestinian Authority in uh, Ramallah is the security and political system of the Palestinian capitalists. And today, when you talk to Palestinians about them, they say they're done and they curse them uh, in, in words I cannot repeat here. And so uh, Mahmoud Abbas have no support whatsoever in uh, the Palestinian uh, you know, streets, whether in the West Bank, whether in Gaza, anyway. Um, because they have been exposed, not just what happened in October 7th, but their entire path have been exposed and failing in the last 30 years since the signing of the Oslo Accord. Now, just like any uh, 1%, you know, the, the capitalist of any uh, society or any country, they try to solve their own crisis at the expense of the Palestinian people and uh, the PA, and that's not working and it's not gonna work. Um, there is studies uh, that happened before October 7th that gave Mahmoud Abbas 8%, I think, or 10%. Also, when they try to, you know, uh, do elections, he canceled it at the last minute because he knew that he will be defeated in any election. Uh, most polls are giving the pro-Palestinian resistance slates in any elections uh, overwhelming majority, up to 80%. And so the situation internally has changed. Now, Mahmoud Abbas have no legitimacy. This authority does not represent the Palestinian people. They were not elected by the Palestinian people. And they are trying to wait and see the results and the outcome of this uh, Gaza, hoping maybe they can come back to Gaza, you know, riding an Israeli tank or an American tank. So that's not going to happen. Um, the other thing is, the other thing is that uh, Palestinians um, wants to have a unified front, uh, very similar to the Algerian example of the National Liberation Front, where all forces of resistance, including popular movements and institutions, could be part under one umbrella. And all attempts of the so-called reconciliation have failed. Uh, everyone knows that the PA is a puppet for Israel. And as long as the PA is doing and serving US and Israel, they'll keep it. But if it stops or ceases to be a useful tool for Israel and the US, they will end it and create some different entity. Colonizers always create entities that can serve them and be a buffer zone between them and the masses that they are ruling. They're not interested in having a direct relationship with the people. They're interested in having that buffer zone. And so even when people sometimes call Mahmoud Abbas to dissolve the Palestinian authority, he doesn't have the will or the authority or the ability even to dissolve it, him or any other one, because it's really an Israeli authority with a Palestinian stand on it. Uh, and so Israel could immediately remove him and have another group uh, and call them the, the new Palestinian authority. Uh, this, is, this is important to see uh, how Palestinians are actually uh, very brave people who are not just fighting the occupation, but they're also dealing with so much challenges and difficulties, uh, you know, uh, internally. Thanks a lot for the description. I mean, of course, you are the person who always correctly describes the Palestinian authority as an Israeli authority in reality, only it looks Palestinian for legitimacy. But, uh, well, um, so like uh, continuing this uh, line, like with the Palestinian authority, Israeli authority, et cetera, and what people from outside look at it. So even those people who have denounced uh, Israel's genocide in Gaza, 
they have also condemned. I mean, it's a sort of both siding the situation and condemning Hamas's violence against who they called Israeli civilians in the October 7th operation. So how would you respond to this narrative of oh, both sides are bad, both sides are committing crimes, war crimes? And also, can you call settlers civilians at all? Um, one thing it's important to clarify, and that is when we talk about Israeli settlers, we are talking about settlers who are armed. And if you don't see someone carrying his M16, uh, he is carrying a gun with him. And so they're armed settlers that I describe them as paramilitary. And they act uh, under the full cover and support of the Israeli official army, but they are an army of some sort that are actually attacking Palestinians, burning their, uh, you know, uh, farms, burning the homes, uh, doing all what Israeli army do, except they're more dangerous because they have no uh, official responsibility. So, you know, they're distributing leaflets now across the West Bank saying to them, wait for your Nakba. And they're doing this by invading Palestinian villages with arms and, you know, the uh, full uh, uh, care of the Israeli uh, army. An Israeli settler could enter to the settlement in 10 minutes and, and comes out with his full military fatigue and, uh, and uh, his uh, rifle. So to distinguish between a so-called civilian settler and an army, it's for Palestinians, that's just a joke. Every Israeli settler in our homeland is a legitimate target for our resistance. And this has to be very clear. The other thing is that it's important not to distort the reality uh, that Palestinians are uh, living. Uh, some people, uh, when they start saying that the colonizer is the same as the colonized, it's it, it literally saying that the person who's torturing the prisoner and the prisoner are the same. Uh, and so let's just blame them. So if Palestinian prisoners tomorrow have a riot in Israeli prisons, they're probably, uh, you know, with these kind of liberal trends, they'll probably be condemned for using violence. And so this is a very uh, narrow-minded sectarianism, very, they don't understand really the reality of the Palestinian people. And they speak from their very comfortable zones and try to, you know, judge uh, Palestinian struggle uh, and try to condemn the Palestinian resistance. Those people usually condemn all resistance, whether it's by Hamas or not Hamas. Uh, the, their, their idea is that uh, they want to blame the victim and at the same time, uh, blame Israel. But, at, but in reality, uh, everyone blames Israel because it's the occupier. So if we take this case to the United Nations and to the General Assembly or to the people, you know, any people forum, they'll blame Israel because Israel is the aggressor, is the oppressor, is the occupying force. But to blame the victim is a very coward uh, position, I think, uh, to say they are the same because they're not the same. Um, and at the same time, is the way we view Palestinian uh, armed resistance and uh, revolutionary violence. Uh, Israelis don't differentiate between a Hamas fighter or a Palestinian leftist fighter or a nationalist fighter. They will target any Palestinian resistance. They don't ask them, uh, you know, are you are you with Hamas or are you with the PFLP? They don't ask them these questions. They target all Palestinian resistance. And that's why the Palestinian armed resistance is very unified. 
uh, very unified and uh, you don't see them uh, anywhere despite the very harsh economic conditions and social conditions even despite our differences we are still maintaining a unified uh, fund thank you for that yeah the, on the following up on this like liberal cowardly narratives i think that's correct analysis regarding the unified front that does exist. Uh, we've heard a lot from the uh, you know, so-called like solidarity forces in the West uh, that you know they would be happier if it was the PFLP leading the operation, but not Hamas. Or you know, what do you? What would you say to this yearning, which seems to exist in what I would say is like the uh, latent Islamophobic left? Um, for anyone but Hamas leading the resistance in this way, uh, although Hamas is a, a people's movement that is elected um, and represents the people of Hazza as well as you know the Palestinian nation in a lot of ways. Yes, because uh, I mean the PFLP will disagree with these people. Uh, they're just. They're just using that in order to justify why they're not supporting the Palestinian uh, resistance. And if we change the equation, let's say a Muslim person or a believer who says to a national liberation movement, why are you led by communists? We won't like it. Uh, 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 you know, and, and it's, it's, it's the same. Uh, it's really important to look at reality and not create illusions in our head and imagine stuff. You know, the PFLP of 1969, it's not the PFLP of 2023. And at that time, when the PFLP used to hijack airplanes, these very same trends used to criticize the PFLP and say, oh, you know, you're too extreme. In fact, in all of these operations, not one single person died or got killed by the PFLP because the idea, it wasn't just, you know, it wasn't killing people. It was, uh, you know, uh, to address the Palestinian question on an international scene. And if you do, you know, if you go back to all these interviews that was conducted with those who were kidnapped or hijacked or captured, whatever you want to call it, by the Palestinian resistance, they had the experience of their life. They're they not against the Palestinian resistance. They actually understand, you know, why they were captured because they were explained to. And the same thing with the captured Israelis in Gaza now. The reason Israel wants to kill them and not allow them to see the, you know, the, the, the you know, a day of, of a life again is because they're scared of what they're gonna say about the resistance, how they were treated fairly, how they were treated with respect, how they were not tortured. But you see how Israel deals with our political prisoners, with the workers they arrest, with the humiliation, uh, you know, they do against our people uh, when they are prisoners or when they are, you know, uh, captured by the Israelis. Because we are the opposite. Uh, uh, and so we cannot do what Israel uh, uh, does. We we are completely on the other side of the bank. But those who want to see the left uh, rising and, uh, you know, having a military uh, capabilities, they should go and support the left instead of say, we don't like Hamas. Uh, it's, just, it's just a very bad position and not one Palestinian would respect that position. You know, the important, including any revolutionary leftist will not, you know, respect that. Uh, and it's also not just liberal uh, view, I think to a large extent is a colonialist uh, uh, view, is that they want to make a Palestinian resistance that fit their images and their criteria and their conditions and the way they imagine Palestinians and not how reality is and how Palestinians are. And this is, this is really, really important to uh, address these issues in the movement 
and to say, you know, to educate uh, some people because a lot of people, they buy into this uh, rhetoric, uh, you know, uh, not, uh, uh, not intentionally, but that's the only discourse they hear. Okay, so uh, I mean, when Talal said liberal, or when I say liberal, we also actually mean the colonial liberal from the West and how they imagine us. I mean, any people from the global South, they have to fit their own imaginations in order for us to have their support in, in, yeah. in any and every case. So, I mean, it has been true for every people who has faced uh, any sort of uh, imperialist violence anywhere, including Venezuela, where Orinoco Tribune is best. No, because I mean, in many cases, PSUV does not fit their imagination. Yeah. They will say Maduro bad, PSUV bad, they're doing this wrong, they're doing that wrong. They're, why are they, when they negotiate with the US, why are you negotiating with the US? When they're not negotiating with the US, why aren't you going to any international platforms? It's the same, it's the same thing. Yes. So, it's a like it's liberal within quotes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And uh, uh, like I will also like you to address another claim by these liberals, which I am also seeing circulating, especially in, online, a lot these days. That Hamas was originally created by Israel, or is funded by Israel, or is even armed by Israel in order to weaken the Palestinian resistance or originally to divide the PLO or to weaken the PLO and now to divide Palestinians. So how would you address this claim coming again from those same people? Uh, you know, uh, a couple of months ago, we, I had a discussion with a, a brother and a friend. His name is Hussam Badran. He's in charge of the national relationship of Hamas and he's a member of their Politburo and he said if people uh, you know look at what we used to do as Hamas 30 years ago you know and, and they'll judge us uh, you know to a large extent in so many cases they might be correct about certain positions we took or certain things we had but we are a political entity and we develop if you look at Hezbollah in 1983 and you compare it to, to Hezbollah 2023, it's not the same because revolutionary movement, liberation movements, resistance movement, political parties, they develop and they change. And so for this accusation, it's just not correct. It's not correct for many reasons. One, Hamas is, as we all know, is the branch of the Brotherhood Movement in Palestine. And the Brotherhood Movement is established in 1928 before Israel was, uh, you know, ever established. Like 20 years before Israel was established, there were Brotherhood Movement. So it didn't create Hamas. Uh, you know, Israel did not create Hamas. Uh, Hamas was founded in 1987 in the first Intifada, and they, not for an accident, because it meant that the Brotherhood Movement in Palestine decided to engage in the struggle. Before that, they were not part of the national liberation struggle. They were adopting a slogan called, we're preachers, not judges. And so they didn't want to have any kind of involvement in the military uh, struggle or even uh, political struggle. Some did and uh, of course, being Palestinians, uh, being a Palestinian, and naturally, you're in uh, confrontation with the occupation. But as a movement, Hamas was founded in 1987, in the eve of December 9th, uh, in the first Intifada. And since then, Israel has been targeting Hamas. 
killing its leaders, assassinating their commanders, killing uh, and, and imprison uh, their members. Uh, and how or why Israel is going to create a movement that it's going to be uh, at the forefront now in combating Israel. What Israel was trying to create is a religious movement that could replace the PLO because they did not want to deal with secular or leftist Palestinians and they'd rather deal with a religious movement. And so they were looking for any kind of religion movement to support them in order for this movement to accept uh, some kind of authority or to use them against the Palestinian Liberation Organization then. But the PLO today and uh, the PA leadership are traitors and tools in the hands of Israel. And Hamas is leading the Palestinian resistance, but not just the armed resistance. If you look at elections, let's say the student movement elections or labor elections or any kind of really popular assembly elections, Hamas will win uh, with the majority. Does that mean that the Palestinian people who are voting for Hamas in the most prestigious Palestinian liberal universities like Birzeit, Hamas will take you know, the, the student council by elections. Even in Christian universities, they win by Christian votes. Does that mean that the Palestinian people don't understand the Hamas and these liberal, uh, you know, uh, voices understand the, the situation more than we do? That is a very ignorant and sectarian, uh, you know, uh, views of the Palestinian uh, situation, and the I cannot see it just a simple naive or ignorance. I think it's calculated to do distortions. They want to distort uh, people. So, and they, they're, some of them are playing in the hands of the enemy and they're being used to spread all these lies. Now, if Israel created Hamas, then why didn't Israel say that they did so? Or why we didn't have not even one document that shows this? or why we didn't even have any kind of, any signal that this actually happened. And if they wanted to create Hamas to come, you know, uh, to create division, then why they killed Ahmed Yassin, the founder of this movement, Abdul Aziz al-Rantisi. All of the founders of Hamas were assassinated by Israel. They weren't assassinated by Palestinians. And so, it's important to study the Palestinian movement and the liberation movement, you know, from especially from you know, the Brotherhood movement. Now, I am I do have my disagreements with you. And we discuss that all the time. And we say it, and I actually have published some of these articles. But that doesn't mean when that you know, this is an internal Palestinian discussion. It doesn't mean that Hamas are traitors because I remember, uh, you know, uh, reading an article by the founder of the Popular Front and who wrote its first text, uh, you know, uh, and the strategy of the TFLP. The, uh, the San Kenafani, the, the great Palestinian writer, he said, he said that there is not one accusation in the book that hasn't been uh, lashed at us. They called us KGB uh, tools. They call us Iraqi uh, tools. They call us Iranian tools. They call us fascists. They call us right wingers. They call us all kinds of names. And so that's because the idea behind these allegations is to say that Palestinians are not capable of creating their movement. Someone else must have done this for them. So 
Maybe Iraq created the PFLP. Maybe Israel created Hamas. Maybe, and this is just not acceptable. It's PS, to be honest. Well, uh, yes, uh, actually, yes. This, um, I mean, I believe that this is also a psyop from the part of Israel because the proofs that these people will show is mostly coming from either Netanyahu speaking or some Israeli general speaking that oh, we paid them this amount of money or we did this or that, something like this, but no document, as you said, no document ever anywhere. And I also believe that these people who I call the liberals, they are, well, they have this disposition, you know, to have an opposition towards any movement with, in which religion forms a part you know, even if those movements are anti-imperialist. So like this, of course, this includes Hamas, but this also includes Hezbollah. It includes the Ansarullah of Yemen, and it also includes, the, definitely includes the Islamic revolution of Iran. So what do you think of this, this contradiction, I would say, of so-called anti-imperialists, or maybe they are real anti-imperialists, but they cannot tolerate any sort of religiosity in anti-imperialists from other parts of the world. But when you look at the Palestinian experience, our people, for example, in the 50s, were shouting slogans for socialism. And Palestinians, uh, you know, they were chanting for unity, socialism, and freedom. Then they shout, you know, they they supported Nasser in, in Egypt and the you know, uh, leading uh, change uh, in the Arab world. And, uh, you know, Palestinians understand that their cause is not just a Palestinian cause, but it's an Arab cause as well. And so, you know, uh, they supported Jamal Abdel Nasser uh, uh, leadership in Egypt. But then after 1967 uh, and the rise of the left, we began to see Palestinian movement, uh, more uh, especially youth, going into the uh, Marxist-Leninist uh, groups, uh, more like uh, leftist revolutionaries or nationalist revolutionaries, and there were no religious uh, groups uh, anywhere uh, in the uh, movement carrying any kind of national liberation tasks, and so being affected by the situation worldwide, the Vietnam, Cuba, Algeria, national liberation movements across the, you know, Asia and Africa, Pal Palestinians, they, they uh, you know, we began to see the, you know, the founding of the, the, the PFLP, the DFLP, you know, uh, and progressive forces. But that changed. And the reason that things changed is because, not because people are wrong, but because these political parties or these political entities haven't delivered what they were supposed to deliver, whether it's Jamal Abdel Nasser and the Arab uh, national movements that were defeated in 1967, or whether these left socialist organizations and political parties in 1990 when we saw the collapse of the Soviet Union and the socialist, uh, you know, bloc, and we saw the retreat of the left worldwide, and the Palestinian left is part of this retreat. That doesn't mean that, you know, right or wrong. It means that a new stage and new forces had to be born. The popular classes and the working classes are not going to rest until the, the left rebuild itself. They're going to go behind and support the forces that are fighting. And when there is a vacuum, someone needs to fulfill the vacuum. In that atmosphere, with the 1979 Great Revolution of Iran, a new stage had, uh, you know, a new era uh, uh, was, uh, uh, you know, began in, in the region. And we start seeing Iran supporting, uh, you know, groups like Hezbollah, for example, in Lebanon. 
1982, when Israel invaded Lebanon and the PLO left Lebanon, the occupation didn't leave. Someone needed to fight the Israeli occupation in Lebanon and, uh, and, and liberate the South. And Lebanese communists participated, Lebanese secular forces participated, but this resistance was led by Hezbollah. I don't care if they like it or not. This is a fact. It's a fact that the, the resistance in Lebanon is led by Hezbollah. And so, just like some of our friends, you know, in the Iranian left, if you fail, you know, why do you want me to go against Iran? You go rebuild the Iranian left. And as a Palestinian leftist, my task is to rebuild the, the Palestinian revolutionary left and also the Palestinian liberation movement. But I can't blame Hezbollah because, you know, Hassan Nasrallah doesn't have Lenin picture behind him in the office. And, uh, you know, he doesn't use uh, Marxist-Leninist uh, rhetoric. Some people are looking at the frame, not at the content. A very, uh, you know, basic mistake that people make. Uh, those who want me as a Palestinian to view Iran as an enemy, I ask them why. What did Iran do to Palestine for me to consider Iran an enemy? When the revolution happened in Iran, they closed the Israeli embassy and they made it the embassy of Palestine. They raised the Palestinian flag. They cut the Shah hand, the, the most you know, ally of US imperialism in the region. They supported the Palestinian struggle. Why would I consider Iran to be an enemy? Now, on the other hand, there are some socialist uh, country led by socialists, their relationship is with the Palestinian right wing, not with the Palestinian left. No one prevented them from like supporting the Palestinian. Go support the Palestinian left, but don't try to use that. Uh, you know, uh, blame those who are fighting Israel just because they're religious. And why do you praise all this talk about theology liberation in Africa and Latin America? And when it comes to Muslims and, uh, you know, uh, our region, the, that is a taboo. We are part of that entire discourse of, uh, you know, liberation and, and theology. It's not just churches. Mosques also could be a revolutionary. Churches could be revolutionaries and reactionary. And mosques could be revolutionaries and reactionary. And we have to look at what does this mosque is calling for? If a mosque is calling for the liberation of Palestine and for equality and for uh, supporting the misfortune and the workers and the, why then this mosque is playing a, a good role, a positive role, an important role. But if it's a mosque calling for, you know, the Saudi prince, and extend the life of uh, King, uh, you know, uh, Salman of Saudi Arabia, that's a reactionary mosque and a reactionary imam. And the same way we look at churches, we should look at mosques with the same objectivity and the same, uh, you know, uh, way and not because that can, could take people into very dangerous judgment. Uh, yeah, that uh, the the sort of conflation of like Khomeinism with Wahhabism is reflects just a great ignorance that exactly. happens. Exactly, um, exactly. Just like they're saying, Hamas is ISIS, Hezbollah is ISIS. When Hezbollah is the one defeated ISIS, right? Exactly. I mean, <laughs> and they don't understand our culture, our history, our heritage, and they just judge things from their, you know, narrow-minded uh, 
liberal, as Sahili said, the liberal colonialist. Yeah. Yes, yes. yes. And they're also Islamophobic. And they also, these days, they actually have problems with liberation theology also. So what can yes. I say? The, uh, the, the interesting thing, you know, it's, it's really important to emphasize the role of the Islamic Republic of Iran as like the primary like solid force of solidarity internationally for the Palestinian struggle, um, as well as for the Arab struggle, the Arab nation, and you know the force of the axis of resistance as being this the primary force of, of genuine international solidarity. Uh, whereas on the inverse, we see that the ceiling of Western solidarity with Palestine seems to be very low, like very, very low by comparison. And we have the both sides thing that you've talked about. Um, but it seems like the limit is, you know, have a protest where we call for a ceasefire, which is a demand that uh, it doesn't seem like any of the resistance have made. They've said they want a cease of aggression, which is seems different to me. Um, so what is your take on this ceasefire now slogan, which seems to saturate uh, at least the United States, but the Western demands and protests now? And how do you, yeah, we'll, we'll stick with that. We'll stick with that before. You see, some slogans are adopted by people because people feel that it's important to say ceasefire in their mind. I'm talking about people in general. In their mind is to end the genocide, stop the aggression, stop these war crimes. But in certain political trends, they're trying to utilize this and take it somewhere else. And there's a big difference when some normal person in a demonstration chanting ceasefire than an organized liberal entity that wants people to say ceasefire as if Hamas and Israel are two you know, equal sides firing at each other. That's misleading. And that's why we do not condone this slogan. And there is one important fact to remember. You will not see one, one person in Gaza who will adopt this slogan ceasefire. They understand, our people understand in Gaza that this is a political slogan that has uh, bad intentions. They want this massacre to end. They want this genocide to stop. They want Israel aggression to stop. They won't say ceasefire. But on an international level, in demonstrations, in mobilization, when someone chants ceasefire and people repeat that, our role, I think, is to actually not to say, um, oh, we don't want ceasefire, but to explain that the uh, content of this is to stop the aggression, the Israeli aggression, and to ensure that the Palestinian uh, resistance is victorious. And, and, and I here is the just of the uh, you know, Hassan, uh, Sayyid Hassan Nasrallah, uh, last speech was that, is that we, our immediate task is to end the aggression and the war against uh, uh, Palestinians and make sure that the Palestinian resistance comes out victorious. Now, ceasefire, if two countries, like in the case of Ukraine and Russia, they don't want ceasefire, <laughs> maybe ceasefire could apply sometime on certain, you know, countries, certain two states fighting, uh, but on national liberation movement or people being subjugated to ethnic cleansing and genocide, and you're asking them to, you know, stop their fire, that's kind of, uh, it's just mis. Uh, leading, that's all. Yeah, you know, I mean, uh, plainly, it's misleading. And you know, to be honest with you, uh, I don't know if I should say this or not, but sometimes some groups uh, who would uh, adopt this slogan 
I think they care about the Israeli capture in Gaza. Uh, and uh, if, if there were no Israeli capture in Gaza, they would probably say a ceasefire. Uh, of course, some trends want ceasefire because uh, they really want ceasefire. They're buying into this ceasefire. They see Palestinians are resisting and they're fighting, uh, especially that, you know, in October 7th, uh, it was a big deal. It was an offensive. It was an action. Of course, it was a, a reaction to occupation, but it was also uh, an, an offensive by the Palestinians. It depends who's saying this and how are they saying this. But as a movement, I won't adopt or condone this uh, slogan. So, <laughs> I th- maybe there's a, a conversation to have off the recording about the value of creating, uh, facilitating contradictions inside of Jewish society or Israeli society. The, you know, I I have seen these jokes that Abu Obaida was organizing the protests inside of Tel Aviv uh, because you know they and they're they're having some protests uh, and that you know there is there is value to that infighting even if it's because they're really just mad that their cousin is, you know, being held. Yeah. Um, yeah. So and I would, like... I would agree with them to have. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, if that's going to get, again, it's the content. It's not the frame. It's not, it's the content. Uh, and uh, when you ask the Palestinian people in Gaza, you know, uh, do you want ceasefire? Uh and they, it's almost like you ask Palestinians in the end, do you want a Palestinian state? And so the state was a misleading uh, slogan that for the popular classes meant freedom, meant the right of return, meant, uh, meant dignity, meant all that. But in reality, it didn't mean any of this. It means a concession. It means 80% of Palestine that going to sign off 80% of Palestine. It means that, you know, we're going to create a Palestinian authority that's going to have a security coordination with Israel. So sometimes slogans are used to mislead people. They look good, but when you go deep into them, it actually uh, attracts. Um, no, th- thank you for that. As a, As an extension, so uh i in germany they recently they started cracking down very heavily on uh solidarity movements and i think seven mountain is is now banned there now officially um in in the context of growing repression inside of the western nations um against Palestinians and anyone who is an internationalist of support of Palestine, what do you see as the a, a genuine force of solidarity that goes beyond these harmful slogans or, or just, you know, in, in, in the face of this kind of repression, what, what would you see as the future of a useful solidarity uh, rather than a um, symbolic one? Yeah, this is a very important question because it deals really with uh, local questions as well as the general questions of what internationalism means, what is the task of uh, our movements in a continent or in a state or in a, 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 you know, a very local level. And before, you know, in the 70s, people didn't have to struggle so much into, um, or maybe before that even, to struggle so much into what does it mean to be in an international solidarity, uh, you know, movement or uh, internationalism. You know, people from Japan, from Iran, from Pakistan, from Turkey, from Latin America, they joined the Palestinian revolution in the 60s, and they fought along Palestinians in, you know, Black Liberation Movements, Black Panther members, and some of them were killed fighting for Palestine. Now, that is the highest form of a solidarity act that someone could actually 
uh, you know, carry as is, you know, um, looking at this as, as one fight, one movement. And then the great example of the Spanish Revolution in 1936, when everyone went to, to Spain to and, and consider that battle to be a battle of everyone. Now, that is a different era. In today's uh, world, I think that we need to look at our people in West Asia um, as kind of one contingent uh, facing imperialism directly. And Palestine is at the forefront of that. I can't see that the movement in Iran or Lebanon or Pakistan the same way I can see the solidarity groups in Switzerland and Belgium. They're just not the same. Not because, you know, but these are our brothers and sisters who are with us in this struggle. They're, 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 they're fighting for Palestine because Palestine is actually theirs. It's actually in their, not just ideas or as an idea, but it's their connected to their lives and the destiny of their people and their and their country and the future of their country. So, so we have to look deep into what does our movement look like, the Palestinian movement, the Arab movement, the you know movements in in in, in West Asia and in taking in consideration that we are living in an interim period. We're moving from one war to another, uh, a world that is dominated by the United States to a multipolar system. Uh, and usually in these kind of interim periods, a lot of uh, things gets hazy. Um, and so I think it's important to see Palestine as a national issue, for example, in Algeria, and not just the uh, people of Algeria are supporting their, Palest their Palestinian brothers, but an actual Algerian issue. Uh, uh, and when you look, for example, on the solidarity movement today, this is a very big slogan. Um, it's not one coherent movement. And you asked about Sami Doon. I think Sami Doon is represent the uh, left of the solidarity movement, uh, and part of that left uh, in the in the movement in general, and the solidarity movement in with Palestine in particular, because they adopt positions and principles that put them in direct confrontation with the Zionist regime and their backers. And that's why they get attacked, not just by Israel, Germany, UK, Belgium, Spain, uh, you know, uh, what have you. They also get attacked sometimes by the left, by the um, liberals. Uh, and so, I think the more Sami Doon like organizations we can see, and the more uh, revolutionary radical leftists in the movement we can see, the balance of power will keep shifting towards our um, line. And when I say our line, I mean Palestine line. I mean the liberation of Palestine versus the two-state solution, uh, the uh, sovereignty of our people and self-determination of the people of uh, West Asia versus normalization forces with the Israeli uh, regime. And so uh, the differences here is very clear, is very clear. And it doesn't mean that we cannot agree with other forces on certain issues on a tactical uh, basis uh, uh, on one issue, on two issue, and we can, you know, work on some of these uh, uh, 
but we cannot, absolutely, we cannot adopt uh, what's already failed. We cannot uh, look at things as if they are the same uh, when they are not. Uh, we cannot adopt slogans that doesn't have content and meaning. Uh, we say, you know, free Palestine. What does that mean? Uh, you know, uh, Palestinian refugees have rights. Good. But what does that mean? You know, it, we have to start giving content to these slogans in order to determine our views towards them and how we understand them. And I think that the, the situation after uh, October 7th have changed and uh, drastically to our side, to the revolutionary side, to the leftist uh, uh, side, and to those who are willing to accept uh, pluralism within revolution, within the camp of resistance, and not, uh, you know, adopt um, ideas because they look nice in United Nations uh, and NGOs world. That's not our world. Our world is our world, and not and and their world is. We know they. You know, they live in illusions and they want to spread their illusions into our movements. And we cannot allow this to happen. We already lost 30 years and we shouldn't, uh, we shouldn't lose more. I would just simply extend from there and ask you about, well, solidarity and everything. So I, I'm actually happy to see such big demonstrations and uh, solidarity movements, including in the in imperialist, like what is called the belly of the beast, you know, the US definitely, also in Europe, but also in our, our countries. And um, I'll just ask you that while you have Hezbollah, Ansarullah, Iran, Algeria, they actually have announced military support, and Hezbollah and Ansarullah actually are like involved in the Palestinian movement, the current one. And uh, even in the countries that are thinking or were thinking or were in the process of normalizing with the entity even in those countries people actually do not support it and we have seen huge protests there also so do you think that and we have had like the president of colombia denouncing israel in the un calling it a genocide calling them um, calling them many things like uh, war crimes and crimes against humanity so do you think that this support for palestine in this current situation would turn into a unifier for the Arab world, as well as raise consciousness about the Palestinian cause, cause throughout the world, you know, maybe like whatever was lost in the last 30 years, would that be regained? And this is something I always ask you, would Palestine become, a, become an important issue in geopolitics, not just in West Asia, not just in the so-called Middle East, but globally, including for the big powers. And I would also, since you mentioned the two-state solution, we all know what our position is. But anyway, I'll just ask you, this position, like the two-state solution, has been raised as a solution by people like the president of Brazil, the president of Colombia, etc., who are in solidarity with Palestine. So do you think that this position is still viable? So it's actually two different questions, I believe, that yeah. whether it, it will be a unifier for the Arab world and the globally, whether it will increase the weight of Palestine as a geopolitical question, and whether the two-state solution is still viable, if it ever was. Let me start with the second question, because I want to give a short answer and, and, and you know, get it over with, because as you said, we, we agree on uh, the two-state solution is not something that was created just, you know, after the Oslo Accord. This is when the partition of Palestine in 1947-1948, when they say a Jewish state and an Arab state of Palestine. At that time, they just wanted to divide countries uh, south and uh, north, uh, and they thought that, well, Palestine is the same. Well, we didn't have a civil war in Palestine the, to divide Palestine south and 
you know, and West, we what we had is is a colonialist settler movement that supported by these imperialist power, and they wanted to displace the Palestinian people and establish this racist regime in Palestine in order to dominate the re the region, not in order to dominate Palestine. Palestine is under occupation. But what they wanted Israel to do is to be a base to threaten the region. So when we talk about Ansarullah, when we talk about Hezbollah, when we talk about Iran, we're talking about the region that is being threatened directly by this regime. And it's very important to look at it, whether Palestinians fought or not, they are in contradiction with the Lebanese people and with the people in Syria and with the people of Pakistan and and Iran, and so on and so forth. That is different than, uh, you know, outside of our areas. Israel still possesses a threat to, let's say, Bolivia or Brazil. They might support some fascist, you know, trend in Brazil, like Bolsonaro, uh, and, uh, and have uh, a strategic relationship with some fascist movements in Italy and in Germany and so on and so forth. But the direct threat of Israel is against the Palestinian people and the people of the region. Now, Hezbollah, Ansarullah, Algeria, Iran, the people of the region, understands very well that Palestine is their cause and that for their people, for our people in the region to have development, to have freedom, to have democracy, to have uh, renaissance. Uh, we must look at the main contradiction between our people and what is the obstacle that it's making us not being able to move forward uh, you know, in 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 our uh, economic, uh, uh, you know, uh, in protecting our wealth, our resources, uh, it's imperialism and Zionism. It's the U.S. and Israel, and and of course the Arab reactionary regimes, who are the advocates of the two-state solution. If you ask who supports the two-state solution. Arab reactionary regimes, liberal Zionists, fascists, and some illusionists. There's no decent movement or some intellectual that re respects her mind or his mind, even if they're not part of a movement that will support a two-state solution. It's not just a liquidation of the cause of the Palestinian people. It's literally selling illusions and not realistic at the same time. So they're not just uh, they're not just selling illusion. They're selling something that it's not possible to even implement. Like where are you going to have these two state solutions? Where the Palestinians say there is no West Bank anymore. For example, you know they they took the entire West Bank settlements and colonies and, and you know what have you. Gaza is under siege. So even if the settlers leave the West Bank, even if they agree to dismantle all the you know their colonies in the West Bank, even if they lift the siege on Gaza, the two-state solution will not be a viable solution for our people. So if they want to have Israel, they can have it in Australia. Or they can have it in the U.S., in Canada. They can give them, you know, some land in France. Maybe Holland could donate some land and create Israel there. But in Palestine, there is no place for Israel. There is no place for Zionist regime. There is no place for Zionism. And the two-state solution is an aggression against the Palestinian people. It's not a favor. But why are they talking about it now? They're talking about it now because they were, they were ready before October 7 to convince Palestinian Authority to accept self-rule government and that the two-state solution 
are no longer viable. The two-stage solution becomes very high ceiling for Israel and Western powers and Arab uh, regimes. They wanted the PA to accept a self-rule government and not two-state solution. Now they're going back a notch as if they're doing us a favor and they're saying, you know, two-state, you know, two-state solution. Now, some of our friends who support the Palestinian people, not necessarily, uh, you know, an enemy or a part of, uh, like, for example, China. China advocates for the two-state solution. And then when we asked our comrades in the Chinese Communist Party, are you willing to divide Taiwan? or give any inch of Taiwan, and they say, no, this is, you know, our policy on this. Well, we have a one Palestine policy too. If you can have one China policy, we can have one Palestine policy too. Why should we donate 80% of our land to Zionist racist settlers? So the two-state solution is related to the camp you refer to. When you talk about Ansarullah, Hezbollah, Algeria, Iran, these forces do not support the two-state solution. They don't go against it in the way that I, as a Palestinian, should and, and can. They try to not to interfere directly, whether for it or against it. But if you ask Sayyid Hassan Nasrallah, he'll say that's an illusion. You tried it never work. Uh, liberation of Palestine is the goal, and it's a noble goal. And it's not only liberation of Palestinians, it's also the liberation of everyone in Palestine, because unfortunately, the only way we can liberate Zionists from their racist ideology and from their racism is to defeat them. Once they're defeated, colonizers recognize uh, how to understand equality and how to understand. You cannot teach them this theoretically or through dialogue. You have to defeat them first, and then they'll understand. That was so informative. Thank you so much. <laughs> um, regarding this defeat, and I, I think this would be our kind of closing bit, I think for, for those of us um, who have a connection to the region and who are following this closely and understand the material circumstances, it's, it's quite clear that the resistance will win, has already won. The question is how big of a victory it will be. A bigger victory will be a bigger cost. As we know, uh, you know the liberation of Algeria was, they offered a million martyrs. Uh, to achieve liberation, and that's an enormous number of people, but it was the biggest victory. Um, what would you say to other members in the diaspora, you know, Syrian, Palestinian, Lebanese, Jordanian, etc., all, all of us who have vested interest in this, who don't recognize that this is a victory and are just see like settle back because i i have this i've i've been disenchanted with this trying to explain to people hey <laughs> our people are winning <laughs> look and they all they, they see is... they didn't believe you no they don't well it's uh we have to understand that sometimes uh, people uh, especially those who are not engaged in the struggle. And uh, all of a sudden they see these kind of images. They get carried away, uh, whether to the uh, extreme, both extremes, and sometimes you get to both extremes. And people exaggerate of how much is and big this victory is, or some people will try to minimize it and 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 and, uh, and I feel that we're still in the middle of the massacre and the confrontation, and it's very and it's a, it's going to be a very long one and a very um, tough one. 
if we base our analysis on the experiences that we have actually seen in the last, let's say, 20 years, we can say that the camp of resistance, after each confrontation, we get more stronger. So in the year 2000, we liberated the South and Israel was defeated. People didn't believe that. In fact, I remember people were telling Hezbollah, do you think you are going to defeat Israel and liberate the South? Well, yes. That's why people fight. If you are convinced and uh, determined that you're going to liberate the South, you liberate the South. And they did liberate the South. And Israel was defeated. And there was no concessions. And they ran away in, in, in one night. They vanished. 2006. The United States and Israel wanted to force a so-called new Middle East. The new Middle East meant to integrate Israel and other entities in order to dominate the region. That didn't work in 2006. Hezbollah capabilities in 2006 is not like 2023. Hezbollah today have 150,000 missiles. 20,000 of them, according to Israeli sources and estimations, are a precise missile very effective weapon. And so why does the resistance get grow and get more strength after each battle? And why the those who are saying, oh, that's not a victory, they get more weaker and they become more irrelevant. Why after every aggression that Israel launched against the resistance, the resistance gets stronger. There are, it's not a coincidence. It's because the people feels that this is the time to develop our resistance and become more stronger because we actually have hope now. Because resistance is not just about fighting Israel. It's about creating conscious is about creating hope, is about creating a, an alternative path to the one that, uh, you know, these regimes have taken us to since 1948. So they have tried peace talks, negotiations, surrender, every uh, one of these things, they tried them. Where did it take them? Did it achieve anything? Take Egypt, for example, 1979. Egypt signed this accord of Camp David with Israel in 1979. Where is Egypt now? Qatar has more role in the world than Egypt. Egypt has no uh, real effect in the region. The Egyptian people are not happy with this fascist government they have in Cairo. Uh, there's 60,000 political prisoners in Egyptian prison. Egypt cannot even open Rafah crossing, a gate. Uh, uh, they cannot open that. They have no political will. They have no sovereignty. And Iran, in 1979, same year that Egypt signed that shameful Camp David Accord, the Iranian revolution happened. And the revolution in Iran af after 1979, it was attacked. Iran was subject to all kinds of embargo until today. Siege, collective punishment. They waged an eight years war against Iran and they killed hundreds of thousands of people. And Iran today is regional power, is strong, is very uh, advanced in science, in technology, in, uh, you know, uh, even in art and cinema, and you name it. That is something to look at. 
surrendering doesn't lead you to development, but resistance can. Uh, surrendering doesn't lead to pluralism and democracy. Resistance can. So the path of resistance is 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 the path that actually imperialists and Zionists are afraid of, because it could end to an entire new world. That's why the liberation of Palestine is not an easy task, because it means the change of the region and the change of the world. 